Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the invite. It's only taken a long time. Arnold's been on me back for yonks, but uh, never fortune. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I was going to send Neville something, but didn't want to bore him. I joined the Australian Navy uh, two days after my 17th birthday on the 10th of January 1970. Spent 30 years in the Navy, paid off in 31st of March 2000. And I served on HMAS Vendetta in Vietnam the same year I joined, ordinary seaman of our grade, firing an F1 machine gun at Flotsam and Jetsam in Bunkow Harbour. Uh, Vendetta was a, um, a gunship and we uh, bombarded Vietnam quite a bit. Then um, after we got back the following year, April 71, I went and done my category training at HMAS Watson and then I joined HMAS Brisbane, a guided missile destroyer. I was going to be a physical training instructor. I used to be pretty fit in those days. <laughs> Things have changed. <laughs> it's probably the age. But at any rate, um, no signal was coming through because I had the recommendations to become a PDI. And uh, so a signal came through for submariners. So I put my hand in the air. And after passing all the sight tests and whatever you've got to go through, I uh, found myself in UK three weeks later on the 1st of February, 72. And so I spent 28 years in Australian submarines. Um, I'm currently the president of the Bombardieri RSL sub-branch and have been for 12 years. I love it. And then, um, I've been asked to join a lot of other committees and I've got enough on the plate as it is. <laughs> right, uh, just going to go through a slideshow. Anyone here know about AE1 and AE2? AE1 and AE2 was our first submarines in 1914. AE1 was lost off Rabaul on the 14th of September 1914. She was in accompaniment with HMAS Parramatta and as a flotilla of warships some 12, 15 miles away. To this day, they have not found that submarine, and they are still looking for it. It's a terrible tragedy. Then AE2, she got posted to European waters, and on the 25th of April, 1915, she penetrated the Dardanelles, and she was the first Allied shipping or personnel to go that far. She was heavily bombarded, whatever, uh, she surfaced to make do repairs and a um, Turkish gunboat come around the corner, started firing and she couldn't dive quick enough. And uh, they found AE2, it's still in the Dardanelles, and it's, um, they're not going to resurface it because as soon as it comes to the surface, it's going to fall apart. So while it's in with the salt water, it's um, staying thing. Sorry? Were the crew taken prisoners? Yes, they were taken prisoners. Some died as prisoners of war. And Lieutenant Commander Henry Stoker was a CO. He was awarded the VC, but he was RN, Royal Navy. <laughs> uh, this is a model of a D class submarine. Um, they, they were based at Harwich, Ermington, Lith, Blyth, and Dover. And their role was pretty ordinary and we were going to buy them. And then in the end they said, no, we don't want them. So we ended up with AE1 and AE2. These are, um, why they put the A in it? Because it pongs out um, E-class submarines. So Australia wanted to be different, so they put A in front of it, AE1 and AE2. I've got um, all the um, mechanical information if anyone's interested at the end. I don't want to bore you too much, so talk any longer than 20 minutes I'm bored, so I'm nearly finished. <laughs> <laughs> what size motors does it carry? What size motors? Two eight cylinder diesels, 1600 horsepower. And obviously diesel electric. The di diesels, a lot of people don't understand with a diesel submarine, 
that diesel engines are only there to charge the battery to provide fresh air because we run on batteries. Uh, when we get to the Oberon class that I served on, I'll tell you a bit more about that. Uh, Berrimer, that was um, a maintenance type vessel to look after the AE-1 and 2. Here he is, Henry Stoker, rough looking character. <laughs> Not as bad as the uh, U-boat captain, <laughs> so pretty rough. Next boats we got were the J-class submarines. Uh, they had a surface speed of 18 knots, displacement of 1,210 tonne. They weren't a very big boat, um, whereas the AE-1 and AE-2 was slightly smaller. But these boats were actually top heavy. And they didn't last long with us because they were all forever defected. And um, actually down in Port Phillip Bay, you've got um, the wreckage. I think it's J1 or J7. I think I've got a slide here. As you can see, the ugly looking vessel. It's at Flinders before they become scuttled. And there's parts of the wrecks of it down in Port Phillip Bay. Our next class submarine was HMAS Oxley and Otway. They're um, a 1926 27 model, and they were quite a good um, submarine. 275 feet in length, 29 foot 7 beam, and a draft of 13.3 inches. 1870 tonne, which is quite a big um, jump up to what um, the previous submarines we had. There's three of them alongside in China. HM's submarine Oberon and HMA's HMA submarines Oxley and Otway. This is a Dutch submarine that was on loan to Australia. They were the K class submarines. Uh, any has been on um, up to Carlingford in Sydney. There's a memorial there for K13, which lost all hands. We, uh, when the submarine base was at uh, North Sydney, Neutral Bay, uh, every year we'd um, go and celebrate that and have like a divisions and whatever a memorial service for it. Some diehard submariners that live up that way um, still conduct their service there for in memory of those guys on K13. Adamant is another um, vessel which um, looked after the submarines, fueled them, and done all the uh, maintenance. Etc. And we come to the T class submarines. These were British submarines on loan to the RAN. T class submarine had a complement of 53 guys. Displacement was 1290 tonne service, 1560 submerged, 270 foot, 75, 6 inches in length, and a beam of 25, 6. They, we used to, um, that while they were on loan to us, they use them as clockwork mouse, they call it. They'd go out and train our surface fleet. Like they'd go in each week um, and whatever, and, and they generally only spend, it, say, a week at sea, come in for the weekend and go out again, etc. But um, it was just mainly to um, get our surface fleet up into ASW action. So, uh, some of you might know where HMAS Penguin is, middle head. Barramoral, that's where they were based. Two class leaving um, the Cockatoo Island, heading back to sea. Over on the last, my favourite boat. <laughs> uh, we um, purchased our first over on class submarine, which was HMAS Oxley, um, in the mid 60s. And uh, she arrived in Australia on 18th of August 1967. It just happened to coincide with the opening of the new submarine base, HMAS Platypus, at Neutral Bay. And it was a big fanfare when she turned up. I wasn't in boats then, I wasn't even in the Navy, but um, she, uh, it was a really big fanfare, because that was our first um, overall class submarine. But she was pre-swap, 
had a sonar dome like that. And uh, it wasn't until 1980 that uh, actually it was Oxley was the first one to become a pre-swap submarine. Um, pre-swap is pre-weapons update program. We got all new fire control and sonar. And that's a control room on over on class, just on completion of refit at Cockatoo Island. We've got new fire control system and everything like that. So um, even little Giuseppe in his fishing boat out there is a target. Every contact we get is a target. And we track that target, the potential target, right? But we track it all so we know exactly where everything is. I mean, it's not only the sonar that we've got, we've got electronic warfare, we've got Eaglint, which is um, wireless mass put up, intercept um, transmissions. Um, a submarine, virtually, is a surveillance vessel. Some of you may say a spy vessel, but I'm not allowed to say that. That's um, HMAS Platypus yonks ago. This is the commissioning of HMAS Platypus. And that was the uh, little motto, platypus on the rock. That was the beak of the platypus was polished every morning before 0800 when the flag went up. Some little AB was in. <laughs> and this is the arrival of Oxley in that same year, 18th of August 67. Onslow up on the slips in Western Australia. Four boats alongside there, all pre-swap, to Ryan being commissioned in Scotland, Greenock. That was our fancy outfit in the early days. Not, not, not wearing, can't see me camouflage overalls these days, so we are real sailors. <laughs> 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 well, one or a better word, because um, in the early 70s, we used to wear pirate rig at sea, which is like just a pair of stubbies and a t-shirt and sandals. And that was the good old days, because um, when the submarine um, is doing uh, special ops, um, we've got to shut down the air conditioning, and it becomes very, very, very warm. And just in the sound room, which is just off the control room, which was my domain, uh, nothing wrong with it to be 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's why we're glad we're in pirate gear. Well, this is a submarine escape suit. Uh, when you go to the UK and do the escape tank, you do a 30 foot free ascent, all you've got is a stole on around you, a nose plug, goggles, and you've got to blow out all the way to the surface because that's how divers get the bends with an air bubble in their bloodstream and if you don't blow out correctly you'll burst your lungs so if the first time you ever do it you do 230 foot just correct what you didn't do you've got divers in the tank as well and believe it or not they can get a good jab right there <laughs> so uh, you soon learn to breathe properly because you don't want that because you get nothing left but uh, then you do a 60 foot free ascent, then you go to the bottom of the tank and you do a 100 foot free ascent. With the 100 foot free ascent, all you've got is a bib, a built in breathing system, you know, like a diver's mouthpiece. And what you simulate is being in a stricken submarine, but you've got to get out now because of the carbon monoxide in the apartment is getting too high. And even though we've got oxygen generators, and CO2 absorption units, it, it can't, and it's up to the senior survivor to say, we've got to go now. And it's a most dangerous time to escape from a submarine in that scenario because there's no rescue vehicles upstairs. What you want is other vessels up there to pick you up as soon as you hit the roof. And in that suit, if you don't have the whole hood on for a, a rush escape, You've got the suit on, but the face mask is pulled down. You've only got your nose plug and goggles. And you've got your breathing thing. There's a whole line of us coming to the escape tank, right? This is a tank here. A whole line of us. Before you move on, 
you make sure that next bib works. Because if you take it off him and it doesn't work, you're dead. Because of the carbon monoxide in the compartment. <coughs> so you check it's working properly, then you release your one and have the new one. And you move on, and then it's your turn in the towel, you take a great big deep breath, you go under the skirting, and as soon as you clear the submarine, you start blowing out all the way to the surface. You continue blowing. You do not stop. And believe it or not, when you get to the surface, you've got yards of air left in your lungs. Believe it or not, it's, it seems like um, your lungs are about this big, but they're not. But it's because the amount of air you've got in, because you're under pressure. And... Um, <coughs> What they used to do, they do it in West Australia now, with the tank there, I've done that one as well. But um, what they show you in the UK, the thing is, if you do not breathe out, you know, a wine cast bladder? Yeah. You know, the silver things? Mm -hmm. You blow it up, an empty one, of course. <laughs> 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 You'd be pretty full when you've got the surface. But at any rate, um, you, you let it go from the bottom of the tank. As soon as it hits the surface, it explodes. That's what's going to happen to your lungs if you don't blow out at the correct rate. And then, then the next run you do is in the suit. They, they originally told us that um, you breathe normally. That is a load of rubbish. You are... <laughs> trust me. And when you've got the suit on the hood, when you climb up into the tower... You've got a stole charge in the sleeve, left hand sleeve. You plug it into there and it inflates the whole suit. That's where your air is. And then what they do, they'll put the lower lid into the towel. It's only one man at a time, mind you. It's very time consuming, but you, because you've got the full suit on, there's rescue vehicles up there for you. I um, give hope. But um, you've got plenty of time sort of to get out. So, the lower lid's manhandled up, put in, it's quite heavy, put it into place, then they start flooding the tower. When the tower is completely flooded and it's equalised with the outside sea pressure, the upper lid will open and you're on your way. And the idea is to try and stand like this, not like this, or like that, because the more angle you lean on, you're going that way to the surface. You want to get up there ASAP, <laughs> straight up. But if you keep going like that, you're going to be off course. And when the other guys get up there, what you do um, with the you've got these mittens on, and you're wearing that, you can believe it or not. It doesn't have to be next to your skin, but you put it over your clothing. It's a huge, big nappy. To wear under there because the first thing you want to do when you hit the surface, sigh of relief, isn't it? Yeah. And you don't want urine in the small of the back because it will perish the, uh, the suit. So that's why they give you this big, huge nappy. When you get to the surface, you intertwine because your gloves have got um, like a lanyard on it. You intertwine with the bloke next door so you're all in one place. So, um, Anyone looking for you from the air can see a big orange patch instead of an individual patch. This is um, HMAS Colac. It was a Bathurst class um, vessel during World War II. Uh, she'd become a tank cleaning vessel. The sonar done was removed of this um, thing because they're doing work on the transducer. But Colac, I was on HMAS ovens in 87 where we fired the first Mark 48 torpedo, live one, at Kylak. She was um, or some couple hundred miles off Kiama somewhere, and she was at 16,000 yards, which is 8 nautical mile, and we fired this weapon at it. It's wire-guided weapon. Even if the wire breaks, the weapon's got its own brain. It will go on the last designated track, then when it goes active, gets a sniff, it'll go in. It's not a detonation um, on, the, on the contact. 
it implodes beneath the keel, which therefore breaks the vessel's back. And when the weapon's on its own, with the wire, it's controlled by the um, fire control system, and you, you can speed it up, slow it down, whatever, step it half a degree right or left. And this weapon, if it misses the first time, it will come up one foot, come back for a read attack. It'll just keep going until it runs out of petrol or fuel. So you haven't got much hope. This is uh, an early plan of the Collins class, which is the submarines we've got now. Um, all that rubbish and fanfare about them uh, being as noisy as a rock band, that's a load of rubbish. And I was in the team that helped quiet the submarines down. What it was was flow noise problem. And um, we um, got them down there very, very, very quiet. And even the, the Abrams were the quietest submarines in the world at their time. And the Americans, um, we play cat and mouse with their nuclear submarines quite a lot. And we get them before they get us. And the Yanks don't like it, but that's it. You get under them. And uh, 1975, 76, Kangaroo 2 up off um, Great Barrier Reef. Um, we detected the Enterprise, you know, the big aircraft carrier. And in, in, in them days, Enterprise was only about 65,000 tonne compared to our 1,500. But um, anyway, we detected them and we detected the uh, nuclear submarine that was um, hanging around the Enterprise. And my captain said, train on the bearing and give them one transmission. We went active. Because we don't go active because you're going to give you a position away. We just listen. Passive. At any rate, we pinged on this um, American nuclear submarine with it for range and whatever. And would have been 15 seconds later, he pinged back. <laughs> but it was all good. Uh, we got it in. Um, the Yanks denied us actually sinking in, in a peacetime scenario, right? The Enterprise, but we had pictures of the Enterprise in the, from the periscope, and they still denied it. And I had all the acoustic tapes to say we got you. <laughs> Collins on a launch, and now there's um, a bit of bit of mixture of stuff here. This is um, Otway and Overland class being cut up for scrap, and uh, thing. And Otway is the submarine down in Holbrook. If you've been through Holbrook, the submarine in the park there, that is not the actual submarine. That is only fiberglass. That is the casing which is there for streamlining because the submarine is just a pressure hole. But you've got all these valves coming out all the way through it. And you can't go through the water with all this noise which is going to create flow noise. Again, give your position away. So they put a casing on which becomes a working platform and therefore streamlining. What's underneath that looks like ballast tanks down in Holbrook is um, concrete. So they make it look like a uh, submarine there. There's no way in God's earth they're going to get a huge submarine down there. <laughs> this was our um, first um, Vice Admiral submariner, Ian McDougall. What a wonderful gentleman. He is a lovely man. And uh, yeah. well, by the way, this badge, that is the submarine badge to make to say that you are a qualified submariner. And we um, each year we have um, submarine reunions in a different state. Unfortunately, not being a millionaire, can't afford to go to every state every year. But um, my partner and I went to Adelaide at the end of September, a um, five-day um, get-together. And some blokes you haven't seen for 30, 35 years, and it's really great to get up. The camaraderie between some mariners is one of the best in the world, and that goes internationally. We've got a couple of Yanks in the Submarine Association in Australia. We've got um, Portuguese. We've got a few different countries. Any country that uh, runs submarines, if they're living in um, runs submarines, 
if they live in uh, Australia, they can join the association with proof of identity, of course. It's um, HMAS Vampire and Onslow in Darling Harbour. If you've been up to Darling Harbour, you can go on board Vampire and Onslow and have a look through an Avon class submarine and a warship similar to what I was on in Vietnam. The Ryan for disposal. Cons pass in the hard stand in South Australia. And this is what the Colac looked like when we sunk it. Well, that's in her three day that, uh, thing. And this is uh, HMAS Torrens, which is a destroyer escort. What's left of it? The Mark 48 torpedo was fired into that in Western Australia in 99. And as you can see, the vessel starting to break up from both ends. Yeah, the other half's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, in submarines, a weapon is outgoing, torpedo is incoming. So if sonar operator or something says torpedo, 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 the first thing the command wants to know is what bearing and how loud it is. And then he will take the appropriate action for evasion. Tamar in Western Australia, just before she decommissioned, the Seahawk landing on the four coast. Who believes that? No way. <laughs> it's just super imposed. <laughs> but I, I like showing this slide to a lot of birdies, you know, guys out at Albatross, you know, push airplanes around, things like that. See what we used to do, you folks. We, we are multi skilled. <laughs> This next slide is a deep submergent for rescue vehicle. That's the type of thing that will come and look for you if you're stranded on the bottom. Therefore, if you're not in real deep, deep, deep water. And this skirting sort of thing on the bottom there, that connects to the submarine escape hatch. On the other one, we had a forward and after escape hatch on the columns have only got one, which is in the center of the vessel. And that um, skirt, skirt sits down there and it makes a seal. So therefore, when the vessel's in, you're in communication with it, you can open the um, upper lid and you can just come straight out from dryness into dryness. And I think they can only carry about 18 blokes at a time. Here's another look at Torrens, or the demise of Torrens. And that's the end of that. I'll open to questions. That's an ugly picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyone got any questions? I'm quite happy to fill them. Yes, Jeff. Why do you refer to submarines as boats, not ships? Uh, well, you heard of U boats, right? Right. I just downloaded this um, the full definition of it. Because I put it in my term. Probably get lost. And speaking of lost, there's a couple of definitions by experts, supposedly. A boat, generally speaking, is a small enough is small enough to be carried aboard a larger vessel. And a vessel large enough to carry a smaller one is a ship. Ships carrying boats, you know, like you all seen life bars on the ships and whatever. That is to say, a seagoing vessel that can be carried, launched, and or tended by another seagoing vessel is a boat, and a ship cannot be carried by another ship. So that's the full terminology. And when you see movies like Das Boot, I can believe how close that was to the truth. Very, very, very good. And Hunt for the Red October. I could not believe some of the terminology that they were using it's come out of my top secret books. And I thought, what the is going on here? So, um, so, um, and, and that about Jonesy, the top sonar bloke, knowing everything, that's typical American. Many Americans here. Too late. Yeah. 
So, um, at any rate, um, any other questions? Yes. How many in a crew? Um, in the Abrams, our standard crew was 67. But when we go on a mission, we'd have in excess of 80. And you've heard of hot bunking. That's where a couple of blokes share the same bunk. Right. Yeah, well, one goes on watch, another one comes off. But we don't have sheets or luxuries like that. We have sleeping bags. And each man's got his own sleeping bag. And that's when you call that. I didn't, I never hot bunk because I was on call 24 7, so that was probably my thing, not getting any sleep. But, um, someone asked me earlier, it's the longest I've been dived. Well, actually, underwater is 10 weeks. Because you've got to get to your patrol area, then dive, and then get out of the area and resurface. So, you could be away for five, six months, but the longest period at one time is 10 weeks of life underwater. Yeah, and only, hold your breath that long, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the submarine comes to periscope depth to put up the um, snorted exhaust mast, which is the same as a kid in the swimming pool. You know, a little thing, he's got a little ball in his um, snort. If a wave comes over that, the ball shuts and he gets no air. The next thing, the kid's up on the surface like that. But that's, it works the same thing. If, if you've got too much back pressure or too much um, water over the top, the ball will shut and the diesel engines are not getting any air. So immediately they've got to be shut down. Like I said earlier, the diesels are only there to recharge the batteries. And... Uh, See, and uh, any other questions? You have a question? Well, I've been researching for two questions I was going to ask. Well, you're a smart, eh? Okay. <laughs> so, so, while you're running on the surface, yep. uh, you actually have got the diesel's engine, but all they're doing is still charging the battery. Yeah, they're, 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 they're running all the time when they're on the surface, just charging the battery up. Like a hybrid car today, yeah. where it's uh, got a, a diesel engine which is just running electric motor to drive four wheels. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, you got like in the over one, we had V16 diesels and they uh, pretty big stone crushers. So, um, I, I also enjoyed your part where you were talking about uh, escape. Yeah, I did a lot of some aqua work in England quite a bit with the aid of my wife, and uh, that's how I'm wearing hearing aids because, uh, can I hear? <laughs> I was diving underneath the ice in the lake in England and I was only down, what, 10 feet. Uh, and uh, it was freezing water. Of course. Water, and it lit a bonfire on the beach, on the shore, where she was boiling the kettle to pour in a wetsuit, you know, when I came up. But that's I held my breath coming up and I perforated my eardrums. Yeah, that's what you get when you don't blow out correctly. Yeah. Kids, well, I was so cold, so you naturally seize up. Yeah. But the kids thought it was marvelous. I could lie in the bath, hold my nose, and lie back and blow bubbles out my ears. <laughs> <laughs> I could, I know, I know a joke. <laughs> I won't go with you. <laughs> yes. Uh, how, uh, how did you cope with the. Um, Close proximity of so many people in such a small place. Well, that's, that's, that's part of your psych test um, for claustrophobic. And um, anyone, whilst you're under training, you are being watched not only by your sea daddy, the guy's got to sign your task book off. So, what you're learning in the classroom, right, there's part one and part two, it used to be part one and two. Part one is general submarine knowledge. Everyone's got to know that. You've got to know every valve, what it feels like in the dark, and what's it for. They're all got different knurls, knobs and stuff on them. And you've got to know every one of them. Then um, you do your part two, which is your category. Say you're a, a sonar operator, you do your sonar thing, or um, 
uh, electronic warfare, you do your electronic warfare stuff. But it, um, in the uh, late 70s, we got rid of radar plotters. They used to be our EW operators. So they had to change category. And a lot of them changed over to sonar operators. And being a supervisor in sonar, radar, electronic warfare, I had to do the EW course as well. Because I can't tell my lads to go and do that and I don't know what I'm talking about. So, um, yeah. Um, well, you're being watched by everyone on board, even your messmates. So if you look as if you're going a bit loopy or something, we get rid of you in the first possible chance. If we're in Australian waters, we're not going back to port, we'll get a helo out and medivac you. We, we don't want them because they're dangerous. Anyone who opens or shuts the wrong valve, we're all gone. And unfortunately, we've been very, very, very close on a submarine, HMAS Ovens it was, and um, the idea of a submarine is to submerge, not sink, and we were sinking and we're going backwards like this, and I was on the planes driving, and a full board of water come down the conning tower from the bridge. The conning tower is actually only 15 foot thing, not that big thing up there that everyone seems to think. That's all superstructure because you've got all the masts behind that. And at any rate, uh, we surface, emergency surface from um, 600 plus feet and uh, got to the surface and I knew there was something wrong because you got a um, panel watch group behind me, an officer watch on a telegraphs, etc. behind me, and the panel watch keeper, he's in charge of the diving and servicing panel. One man to look after that. Well, we hit the river at 100 feet from the surface, the captain ordered main vents to be open. Main vents are these huge peeping. You open them and water comes in underneath in the open tanks. He wanted to keep the bodily weight of the submarine down because the last time we were at the surface, which was 40 minutes ago, it was quite rough. We didn't want to go, come beam on the sea and turtle the submarine over. So 100 foot, he opened to keep the bodily weight down. We hit the surface, the officer watched and look out, got to the bridge. And I'm thinking there's something wrong, something wrong. Actually, main vents were still open. And then that full bore of water come down the conning tower into the control room and it's got to go somewhere, so it goes all over me. 115 volts across my leg, 24 DC in my back. And that should have killed me, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, any rate, I'm calling the depth and the angle as we're sliding backwards. And both sharps are going full air together. We're blowing main ballast, and I went, main vents, main vents, but no one could hear me because of the horrendous noise of this um, full bore of water coming down the tower. So, um, at any rate, uh, they eventually got, uh, by blowing main vents with um, the uh, ballast tanks open to um, susceptible to water, we were wasting a lot of air. It was 4,000 pounds per square inch that blows in there to blow the water out of the ballast tanks. And uh, at any rate, they finally got main vents shut and we we're trying to get the surface on the low power blower. The low power blower only provides 20 psi compared to 4,000 psi. Very, very, very slow process. And we were looking back to uh, Platypus late at night and the senior sailors took the captain up to a bar up in North Sydney. We had a few and he, the captain said to me when we come back, he said, Bob, get me up early, I've got the board of inquiry. He said, who's going to get me up? <laughs> so at any rate, uh, unfortunately, that captain, he got the sack from the RAN. And you've all heard about the loss of three sailors we lost in the, during the Oberon class. 1981 was Chris Paslow had an engine run on. That meant the submarine had stopped snorting, but the engines were still going and it sucked in all this foul air. So foul air went through the submarine and he was down with the junior sailor's bathroom. As they found his body there. He was only a young bloke under training. 
whereas everyone in the control room were on that another breathing system. And at um, any rate, so that was 81. Then 3rd of August, 87, we lost two lads over the side of a submarine. The submarine dived while they were inside that fin, that big area, that big area there. They were uh, stowing the tow to Ray Sona. And no one had done a proper checklist. The submarine dived, and there was evidence that Abel Seven Mark Rowe, the senior bloke, this was the other bloke, Huey Bear Humphreys, he was a trainee. Anyway, there was evidence that he tried to cut the lashing on the upper voice pipe cop because normally when you dive, the lower voice pipe cop remains open until you go down to say 70 feet back to 53 feet to get the air bubbles out of the tanks. And then you'll shut the lower voice pipe cop in case someone is still up there. But this submarine was a cowboy boat and they shut the lower voice pipe cop immediately. Their bodies have never ever been found. And uh, Huey Mark Rowe, the, the AB, he served on a couple of submarines with me. And uh, pretty bad at the time. Any other questions? How were the people on this uh, submarine fed? That's a practical thing, but... How, how were we fed? We, we had three to five meals a day. We had two chefs and we had very good meals. Very good meals. But a submarine, a nuclear submarine and a diesel submarine, um, we can stay at sea the same time. The only thing that stops us not staying at sea, especially the new boats, because they don't have to refuel or anything, is morale and how many victuals you've got left. You run out of food, the boys, the morale's going to go, what? <laughs> so that's that's when it's all over. So normally um, three months is um, is all the provisions you carry for. We've had this submarine accident off the east coast of South America. Could you give us uh, maybe a, an insider's view of yeah. what's happened there? We've seen it in the news and in the media. And um, there's a lot on the submarine website. We're all very, very, very upset. Um, what uh, we think's happened, the submarines dived, but they knew where it was coming from, uh, Uishua, and where they were off to. So it's got a designated track, so the high end command know where it was going. And then when they heard that explosion, that was on the same track. It was about 200 miles further on. So what me as a submariner possibly thinks happened, they've had a fire, possibly an electrical fire, and when you have a fire in a submarine, you do not surface. Because as soon as you surface, you're letting all the oxygen in and you're dead anyway. So what the idea is to go deep and sort it out. Because if you're at periscope depth, you've got someone on the after periscope maintaining surveillance, you've got guys operating gear to um, electronic warfare, pick up any radar emissions and things like that. You're making yourself vulnerable while you're trying to fight a fire at periscope depth um, because you could get run down by a super tanker. Some of them super tankers are going to draft for 200 feet. So, um, so you go deep and sort it out. And then I think what may have happened, they've had a complete electrical failure, possibly followed by an hydraulic failure, and she's gone below crush depth. And that's the implosion. So each country that operates submarines, depends on the type of submarine, you've got an operating depth, a safety depth, maximum diving depth, and a crush depth. And NATO countries like UK and us and the Yanks we have got a pretty large factor between our maximum diving depth and our crush depth. So we've got a thing you can probably go on extra couple hundred feet. But bye -bye. So that's what I, I think and the community, submarine community thinks that's what happened and we feel for them because I put on Facebook, it um, doesn't matter what country you're in 
or what country that operates submarines, we are all in the same boat. So we know exactly what's going on. And it would have been absolutely terrifying. Same as in 2000, the Russian submarine Kursk, she went down. Boy, I spoke at the sub ranch um, about that. And um, not good. Could have, could have been any one of us. And I can imagine if it was an Australian submarine that uh, disappeared like that. We'd all be in mourning. But uh, anyway, is there any other question before I finish? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, let's give Bob a hand for. Thank you, Bob. And uh, we always present our speakers with a. Uh,